I want to take a couple of minutes just to say a bit thank you for, for you, Anya, and all the contents team, uh, of course, to, for organizing this meetup and for spreading the word about research ops and for giving me the space to tell my story, which I find is very curious and I hope it inspire others to, to shift their careers also to research ops or at least uh, take some insights and learn from, from this talk. So without much introduction, uh, I will start introducing myself. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Agustina. I'm originally from Buenos Aires, from Argentina, and I'm now based in Barcelona. And I'm the research, I'm a UX research operations specialist at Travel Pack, as Anya mentioned before. Uh, today I'm going to tell you a bit my story about how I transitioned into, into this uh, role of research operations, which I'm totally passionate about and I can be speaking for hours and hours. Um, I'm an accountant originally, so nothing really close to UX or, or research at all, or, or any background on, 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 on psychology or nothing. My, my background is completely uh, related to numbers. Uh, once I graduated, I travel a lot. Uh, basically, I work and travel abroad for around uh, 80 years until I landed here in Barcelona, in Travel Perk specifically. Um, curious thing about my story, I started in customer care. So for me, it was a great opportunity to learn a lot of things about our product uh, and, of course, about our users, which is more important. So um, I started in, in, in customer care with, with all giving the support to uh, our users and learning and having a holistic view about everything uh, on, on the product, basically not focusing only on one feature. So I think that actually helped me a lot to bring that expertise uh, when it comes to, to shifting into research operations. Um, Curious thing about how I, I got the opportunity to turn uh, into a research operations. Uh, by that time, um, the team was only one researcher. They were starting to build in the, the research team. So mainly all the research was handled by designers and product managers. And you can imagine it was a bit of a mess. So they decided to put someone um, to bring some order and, and some processes and, of course, being very conscious that we are on a B2B business, so we have to be a bit more protected with our users. So they decided to open this role internally. And I always said that it was a really good call from, from the team uh, to bring someone from customer care that already know the product a lot and the users. Um, I was quite surprised when I got the, uh, I remember myself uh, when, I, when I read the, the job uh, description. I didn't know this job even existed, to be honest. Um, but I was super passionate about our customer feedback. So I said, why not? I gave a chance. And I, I took some really um, quick courses about UX research to learn what the, the, the craft was about. And I completely got uh, in love with, with, with the practice and, and the role. So I applied for the role and then I got the, the, the position. And it's been a journey of a bit more than two years now. So um, everything that I'm going to be talking through today is basically my own experience in, in Travel Pack within these two years. So I hope you enjoy all the tips. Um, cool. Uh, some skills, uh, probably that I think we, we should need to be uh, on the research operations role. Basically, not any relevant background. As I mentioned, I come from a completely background like, like a different background from many uh, other researchers. Uh, I'm very passionate about numbers. Um, so nothing really close to psychology or sociology. Um, but yeah, I think uh, as, as you put your passion on this role and you are creative, open-minded and organized, everything would work. Um, one of the key things I think about this role is uh, I always like to say to be an explorer. So, uh, you know, have this curious mind and don't be afraid to, to try new things and get creative and really crazy and, you know, play with automation. So I think it's a, it's a role that actually goes a lot with your personality if you are that type of person. And um, yeah, you can get really crazy and start uh, testing a lot of things until something actually works. Um, and of course, I think also you have to have a bit of a spirit of service because you're going to be collaborating with a lot of people, even if you don't think. Trust me, you're going to be collaborating with lots of people in your team. Um, so, and, and you're going to be serving them at some point. So it's important that you have this spirit of service and you're very flexible and you can adapt to changes really fast uh, because you're going to need it. Um, but then, you know, the hard skills, I, I leave it to, to all of you. You probably, uh, anyone in this call might have other skills that, that are required for the position. And uh, I think it's, it's a very 
the, the variety of skills is, is really wide and, and as long as you put your passion and, and you work hard on it, this, it, it will be definitely a success. So um, what is research ops and why it's so important? Um, probably there's a lot of people here with a research background, but it's always nice to, to go back and refresh our memories a bit and give you a bit of context about what is research operations. Um, it's curious, I find myself reading about research ops when I was applying for this role actually, and I was so lost. I mean, it was such a little information at that time and everyone, everything was spread all over blogs and, and podcasts. So it was really hard for me to get kind of a definition. Uh, and of course, there wasn't also, I couldn't find any course or something that you can actually take and learn about how to do research operations. So um, I tend to read a lot about the research ops community. Um, and that's where I found this, um, this definition. You can read it on the, on the slide. But basically what I like to say that um, or I tend to do at least, is to take all the hassle out of the research practice. So um, basically the research operations uh, people, we, we take care of the operational side and all the admin stuff that the researchers probably they don't want to do, um, which, which is what are processes and other sources and tools to help scaling uh, the, the research craft in, in the companies. I think it's really important if, if you have the chance to have a research operations dedicated, one dedicated person in your team, because um, they will have, you know, they will take care of the operations and they will allow researchers and non-researchers to focus on what they need to focus, which is, you know, handling and, and leading all the research and analyzing. Uh, but in case you don't, you don't have a, a dedicated research operations, all the tips that I'm going to share with you today, it's also valid. If you're a researcher and you, you spread your time between doing research and taking part of the ops, you can also take a lot of the tips that I'm going to be sharing with you today. Right. Um, how to start a research op role from scratch. Again, this is uh, what I've been learning in the past two years, I would say. Um, when Anya introduced this uh, meetup to me, it's funny because I, I thought this, all these tips, if I was you know, when you had the chance to go back two years and have a coffee with yourself, that's that's mainly a conversation with myself two years time. So uh, basically everything that I'm going to share is kind of a 10, 10 things I, I wish I knew before, but it's basically some tips that I would give to Agustina two years back when, when I started. I have to be honest, I was completely lost, completely lost. The fact that actually uh, I didn't have a, a UX background um, and, and nothing related to research. At the beginning, I was super lost, but I got a lot of support of my colleagues at that time. Uh, so yeah, I've been learning a lot throughout this, this journey. Uh, but again, I, I, I think those are all, all funny, uh, I mean, interesting insights that I'm gonna be sharing uh, if I was myself two years back. So let me start with the first one. Uh, I would say, yeah, it's important to learn what UX and research operations are about. It's really something that we take for granted. And of course, you know, it might be something that it's it's super easy to do. And, and, and of course, why not? I mean, if you're applying to a, a UX research operations role, then you should know what it, the role is about. But it's important because at some point, especially for those coming from a different background that is not related to research, um, it's important that you can get you know, familiar with the vocabulary, with methodologies and ways of working. Um, I actually took some courses, not only to apply for the role and, and, and have a good interview, but also because I needed to know what I was talking about and, and what the role was about. So I started also reading articles, uh, blogs and podcasts. I'm still doing, and, and this is something that uh, we, constantly, we constantly do, I think, uh, and condense you, you have a lot of uh, podcasts and blogs, so it's super interesting if, if you want to check them all as well. Maybe, Anya, you can share the, the link with all the information later on, but there's a lot of very rich information that it's valid. And what I like the most, it's uh, people working in the field. So uh, you will have um, a lot of tips and insight from actually, you know, real colleagues. It's not something that you'll read on a book, which is probably updated and, and it apply more to your work. So yeah, take some time to learn about the craft and, and especially about research operations, not only about the, the craft itself, but also it's good to, for you to get in bed with um, tools and practices and other ways of working because uh, it's, it's very important and, and it will enrich a lot your, your career and your role. So tip number two, 
uh, learn how research is done in your company. This was one of my biggest mistakes, I have to be honest, when I joined. Um, not only blaming myself, I would say when I joined, the team was already uh, kind of built and there was some research done before. And I didn't took actually the time because I was super lost. I didn't know that I, it was important for me to picture, you know, to take that picture at that moment when, when I joined. But basically I'm talking about um, getting your first, it's also a, an opportunity for you to start, you know, your first research project if you don't have experience on, on research. So you can ask colleagues for, for help on, on the research plan and script. So you can also experience firsthand a research project. But it's important to understand how research is, how the research is currently done on your company. Uh, and I mean, uh, how frequent, how often they do research, how many projects they have for months. So you can picture a bit of the volumes you're gonna go, uh, start getting. The methodologies that are being used also on your company will help a lot also uh, with the tooling that you will be using. Um, get in bed with the processes, tool and resources and, and understand uh, what's working and what is not working and what can actually be uh, quick fixes for you when, whenever you start a new role. Um, and also it's very important if you, if you find out if there are any trainings uh, any previous training have been done or provided by whom and, and, and how old were they provided and what topics were around because it's also important that at some point um, you start training your, your own team. So um, again, kind of have a, a notice and, and understand how the research is done uh, at least at the moment you join the team. So that will help you a lot to understand uh, actually what's working and what's not and what should be improved. And apart from that, when you understand, once you understand how the research is done, you need also to identify your users. That means know your audience that you're going to be referring to. And speaking about audience is, OK, who are you going to be working on um, in, in terms of are, they, are you going to be working with a, full, uh, a team full of researchers? Are you going to be working with people that are non-researchers, but they do research and understand the level of experience that the people that are doing research actually they have? Um, it's important also to understand if there are other stakeholders involved in the process uh, that you, you should start collaborating with. In my case, for example, we, as, as in B2B, we have account managers in the middle. So um, it was important to include them also in all the processes that we uh, set up for, for the research and especially the recruitment. So again, try to picture and understand how many people and stakeholders will be impacted in, in your process so you can start collaborating with them and building a process. And also what other teams that you don't think that you will be collaborating, but you're probably going to be in constant communication like IT, legal or data privacy, community team, etc. I mean, there's a lot of other people that are on the background that probably you, you just contact them at the beginning, uh, you know, to set up your tools, but then with legal to um, work on the GDPR disclaimers on all the governance that you're going to be doing, community or office management team. At some point, you're going to be, uh, you know, spreading the word about research or research operations within your company and you want to have a space uh, you know, to, to share with your company. So make sure that um, you, you understand, uh, apart from the people that will be doing research, how uh, other stakeholders that might be involved on, on your processes. It's also very important. Number four, uh, use the research ops framework as your guide. This is, um, I found it super helpful. Uh, this is a map that it was an initiative from the research ops community. Uh, they started doing, they interview a lot of researchers uh, and, and mother experts, and they found that all those um, different tasks and, and things that for me, it was a, a super interesting guide to understand actually, okay, what, what are the limits for research operations? What should I cover at least the minimum and what things I can start, you know, little by little incorporate into to my work. Um, it's kind of complex, looks like a lot, but uh, you can take the time to, to read it. I put the source down there so you can check it anytime. Uh, but for me, it was a great guide still. Uh, I still use it. I always have it bookmarked and, and every time to time, every quarter that I have to improve something, I go back and I try to incorporate something into my work to make sure that, you know, I, I, I try to cover all the, all the pillars of the research operations role. Uh, but basically, you know, you have a lot of information about participant recruitment, the guidelines and templates, governance, 
the tooling, budget management, knowledge management as well, and then everything around communication and advocacy. So uh, I really suggest taking the time to to read this and and if you can bookmark it and have it as a as a place to go back and check all the time because um, for me it really it was really helpful to understand again uh, all the pillars of the research operations uh, craft or, or yeah the craft itself but also to define priorities and and what you know what are the next steps that I'm going to tackle because once you understand again as I mentioned before how the research is done what improvements you need to do and what people should be involved then if you take this map into consideration, you will start in this. You, you can understand what things you should tackle definitely uh, at the beginning because they are super urgent, and then what other improvements you can do along the way. So yeah, this this uh, framework I discovered actually, you know, after a few months of working, uh, I regret not having them at the beginning, but uh, still very helpful anytime you you check it. All right, number five, one thing at a time. Uh, that's really a good advice that I can give. Focus on the priorities and plan your next steps. Uh, again, as I mentioned before, the, the, all the pillars and, and the components of research operation, they can be quite a lot. And at some point you can feel that you're a bit overwhelmed. So make sure you go little by little and start you know, going one thing at a time. Once you have that implemented, move to the next one and try to incorporate things into your work. But just make sure you don't want to do everything at the time because uh, yeah, it, it might get a bit crazy. So um, that's another suggestion for you. Uh, number six, think big. Uh, always have in mind this question, would this scale? Um, again, it looks, it, it sounds really, you know, very, very simple, but uh, again, I think this was one of my biggest mistakes and I regret not thinking big when I started. Um, definitely, if I go back and take that coffee with Agustina two years ago, this is uh, this probably would be the, the the suggestion number one I would say to her, uh, because we tend to do sometimes to do some quick fixes or implement something that it will work um, for the type of environment that we have at the moment. But then, as soon as everything starts scaling, it can get a mess. So you will save a lot of time and effort um, as if you do your own research. Uh, but it will definitely save you a lot of effort and time and money if you start thinking uh, on a big, on a larger scale, uh, really at the very beginning of, of your project. So always keep this question in mind and think, okay, would this process that I'm building, would this work if, if at some point we have, I don't know, 10 times, we grow 10 times the, the team or the volumes of research or, or what the work that we're doing? Uh, I have a very clear example that I can share with you is um, when we started uh, two years ago, we have a process with the account managers. So as, as in B2B, we have uh, the, the account managers in between us. We build the whole process. It was a, an amazing Slack automation with our table. It was beautiful. But then um, it really worked a lot for the team size that we had at the moment. So there were kind of a 10, 15 account managers. Our team were only a team of two. It worked perfectly, but by the time the account management team started growing and our team started growing, uh, it got a completely mess. So uh, I, I have to, to to face the challenge now to to revamp everything and go back to this uh, audit that I told you at the beginning, understand what is working, what is not, and try to think of another way of, of doing this because it was not scaling and the volumes that we got, got really, uh, yeah, five times that we were doing at the beginning. So it was not sustainable at any point. Um, so yeah, I mean, it worked at the beginning from the size of the team that we have and the volumes, but now it's not working. So we have to rethink the whole process and it's taking a lot of time and effort. And especially uh, not only implementing something, but also the time and the effort that it takes training uh, a whole new team on, on a new process. So again, if I could go back to years time and, and said to Agustina, it's like, please take your time uh, and uh, yeah, and think of on a larger scale, something that you build. Um, and this applies not only for processes, but also for tooling. So think of the tools whenever you give an access or, or the or the seats that you, you get for a tool. Think that at some point your team can get bigger and this will also be um, translated into more money that you will need to spend in, in tooling and access. So um, make sure that you cover that at some point whenever you're um, assessing a new tool. Um, 
another interesting thing it's yeah what can be automated delegated what can be uh you know uh, put on a template i wrote on a very interesting article also with anya about automation so very curious if you're curious to, to read it about but there's a lot of tips and insights over there to um decide what to automate and not so i really suggest if you have the time to read it and then another thing that we should think about whenever we're building something is, okay, what can be democratized and what we want to still have control on? On This will be very important for you to define um, these things that on, on a process that will help you uh, figuring out what you want to you know, empower your team to do and what other things you, you want to keep doing and, and controlling yourself and, and your team. So again, keep this in mind and, and think big. Don't be afraid. Um, okay. Tip number seven, make good friends. Uh, not only at work, but also this is also for life. Uh, but I would say, yeah, make sure that you, you make really good friends. Uh, as I said at the beginning of, of the talk, you never know who you're going to be collaborating with. Um, so yeah, you're going to be partnering with a lot of teams, even if you don't think and you said, you know, I, I only work with the design team or the researchers, but at some point you will be collaborating with a lot of people, IT, legal, account managers or customer success, community, um, you also have the designers, the product managers, content designers. So there's a lot of other uh, people that you, you cannot imagine. And, and at some point, you, it's very important that you actually, you know, collaborate with them. So make sure you're very nice to them because you never know when you're going to need their help. Um, okay, tip number eight, document as much as you can. I know uh, I'm a big fan of documenting things, but I know people, you know, uh, some 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 of you might not be very fun of, of you know, taking time to make processes. Um, but especially if you are on a team of one, uh, like myself, or you're doing, you know, you're taking care of the operational side while doing your research, um, it's very important that you take the time to document everything you do, at least the processes. Um, Something really curious when I joined the team uh, as a research operations, again, I was super lost and I, I, I was expecting to have a lot of guides and an onboarding, uh, okay, to teach me. It's like, okay, what's research about? What, what are you going to be doing? And then there was nothing. And I started building little by little all the, the documents about what I do, how I do it. So whenever you don't hear and someone else needs to do it, you make sure that, you know, the, the information is available to everyone. Um, and also, you know, to 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 prepare your team and 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 give them templates or or any documentation that they might need at some point for for their practice and for doing their work. So yeah, make sure you can take some time to document and create the processes. Um, almost getting to the end. This is another very important one. Uh, network with other experienced colleagues. Uh, I have to be honest that I I, I start networking with other people really you know, a few months time uh, now, uh, and I regret not starting at the beginning to connect with other research operations people. Um, not only because it's nice, you know, to be in touch with other colleagues, we are not that many in the end. So um, it's always nice to, to, to be in touch with other colleagues, but also I think it's super important that you can actually learn about others. Um, in my case, I've been, you know, my, my only experience was is at Travel Park here in, in the past two years. So at some point I feel like, you know, when you have only uh, your couple and you've been, you know, together for a lot of years and, and, and you're missing something that was, that I, I felt at some point it was missing. It's like, okay, how do other people do their jobs in their companies? How, what are their struggles? What are the ways of working? Uh, you know, each of us, uh, you can read a lot of, 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 of blogs and content over there, but at some point each of us had our own own ways of working. So I really enjoy, uh, you know, jumping on a call with another research operations and learn how they do their things. Uh, what are they struggling with? Uh, what are the ways of working? What tools do you use? What time, you know, it's really nice to, to learn and, and, and yeah, learn from others experiences and share your own as well, because uh, you never know when someone else can get inspired with what you tell them. Uh, I actually started last year with another colleagues. Uh, we built a research ops community in Barcelona. So the idea was to have in real life gatherings and, and share not only these ways of working and, and approach people with, with the same profiles and, and experience and ideas, but also it was, it was important for us to have a local community to share um, other information like vendors or regulations on, on the country, 
salaries, you know, that's something that we don't discuss very often, but it's also nice to discuss salaries with other colleagues or other struggles that we might have on a daily basis. So um, I would say this is another, my, my favorite one is network as much as you can and try to connect with people. There's a lot of people available. I start stalking them in LinkedIn, uh, but I connected with really a lot of people. Some of them that are on this call today and supporting me. So thank you very much for being here. But um, it's it's really nice to learn from others and also to share your experience and, and inspire other colleagues to to work on on their things. And this is number ten. You know, I wanted to close with something really nice. And I I always said that it's very important that we can stay humble and open to learn. It's it's especially you know I was I was super grateful because I found not only a profession but a role that I'm super passionate about and I love what I do. Um, so I, I'm always open to learn, not only from my colleagues at Travelpeg, but also from other colleagues uh, around there and other research operations. And whenever I have the time, I, sh I try to share my story or, or, or my experience, uh, but I always stay humble and, you know, uh, get your feedback, always ask for feedback if you can, try to improve whatever thing you can improve and, and, and you will, you'll be successful on what you do. So that will be my number 10 to close uh, the, the tips. And before we run out of time, I wanted to wrap up. It's, it's kind of a, you know, a summary of what I went through with all the, you know, my, my two years of experience on, on a research operations role. Again, learn about the role as much as you can. Be curious and, and, and connect with other people if it's needed. Understand how research is done in your company and who is doing research. So know your audience and, and you, that will make you, that would help you a lot to, to know when, when you will need to refer to someone. It's not the same if you need to do a training, for example, to a researcher or someone that, you know, they don't have the, the experience or the knowledge, they're non-researchers. So it's very important that you know your audience whenever you're creating content specifically. Um, yeah, have a look at the research operations framework. If you want to have a book market, it's really important. I always use it as a guide to keep improving and incorporating new things into my role. Um, Whenever you're thinking about building things, make sure you take one step at a time, but think of something that can scale. It's super important, uh, and that will bring a lot of success on, on what you build. Partner with other departments. Uh, make sure you make good friends. Ask them for help whenever you need. Uh, don't be afraid to ask help, and, and it's super valid that you say, you know, I don't know, teach me. So yeah, whenever you, you need help from any other department or any other colleague, make sure you, you raise your hand and you ask for it. And yeah, the, my favorite one, try to network as much as you can and learn from other ways of working and, and from others. So just in time, wanted to thank you all for being here. You can connect. I mean, if you're happy to, to network or connect with me, there's my LinkedIn over there. I'm always available for, for a friendly talk, a coffee or, or whatever thing you need. Um, and yeah, that was all. <laughs>